time that next year's mass conference is already set for April 25th through the 27th of 2022. Um, this is the first year and then next year obviously uh, we'll be kicking off uh, hopefully in person. Uh, but without further ado, I'll pass it on to our PR student again. Let her introduce herself a hundredth time in this conference. But Kat, go ahead and take it away and introduce our final speaker for the conference. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Catalina Sanchez. Just to reiterate what Professor AJ said, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat on WebEx, the program that we're using uh, for the conference, or you can visit our Instagram mass period conference uh, at our Instagram story uh, sticker to ask your questions. Um, so before we begin, I just want to introduce Steph. Um, she is actually a Olu alum, so welcome to the Olu realm, wings up. <laughs> um, that being said, it's my pleasure to introduce her. Uh, Steph Sanders, that's her name, is the Grants Manager for the Community Behavioral Health Division within the Colorado Department of Human Services, Office of Behavioral Health. She has more than 10 years experience designing grant documents and sustaining funding for nonprofit organizations in the greater San Antonio area and statewide initiatives and community programs throughout the state of Colorado where she's visiting us virtually. Um, Stephanie provides subject matters expertise in development campaigns, private foundation grant making and supporting single state government authorities with project coordination and timely creation and submission of federal grant deliverables. Stephanie earned a Master's of Arts focused on technical communication and grant writing from Our Lady of the Lake University. Her session today is called Grades to Grants and Government. So without further ado, Steph, please take it away. Thank you, Kat. And thank you for the introduction. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen now. Okay, Kat, is everything good on your end? Yes, you're okay. all set. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, as Kat just mentioned, uh, my name is Stephanie Sanders. I'm the grants manager for the Office of Behavioral Health, which is one of the office within Colorado's Department of Human Services. So we are the single state agency for behavioral health in Colorado. So that does include substance abuse services, as well as uh, being the mental health authority. Um, so before I get further into my introduction, I first actually want to start by sharing my inclusion statement with everyone. And my inclusion statement is that my goals are to promote respect and help foster diversity in all my contacts with others, uh, seek out more workforce development opportunities for Latinas and in journalism and communications and to be an advocate for the inclusion of minority populations. Um, having served as a grants manager within the public health sector of Colorado, I support grant writing um, across multiple disciplines, including the humanities, social sciences, STEM, public health, and other areas that need funding to survive and thrive. And um, in addition to that, uh, well, specifically the funding is private, local, state, or federal. But in addition to that, with a demonstrated history in public service, I do bring together a passion for words as well as uh, combining that with important policy work being done to make people's lives better. And I'm always open to opportunities for personal and professional growth. And so as Kat mentioned, I did receive a Master of Arts from Our Lady of the Lake University. Um, previous to that, I did receive my Bachelor of Arts from St. Mary's University. Um, at the time, I did have a concentration in journalism. So with that, um, looking into graduate school, I, I was really wanting to build on my journalism skills, which were definitely focused in copywriting and copy editing. 
obviously where we are in the journalism landscape now has vastly changed in the last 10 years. Um, but uh, that definitely gave me something to think about as far as what can I get out of Our Lady of the Lake in seeking a Master of Arts in English. Um, there's not really a grant program um, or necessarily a journalism master's program. But like I said, I wanted to take a lot of those skills that I had already built in undergrad and explore what my opportunities could be um, upon taking advantage of a program at Our Lady of the Lake. The inclusion statement that I just shared with you, uh, that is something that I use uh, in general, um, just as a professional, but also when looking at current jobs that are being marketed related to grants. I think it's very important to have an inclusion statement to understand where you as an individual, um, what your passions are and what specific communities you might want to serve, but also does that sync up with the mission of other organizations that you might be looking at. And so what I'm going to dive into today is sharing what my experience has been at Our Lady of the Lake, but also sharing what I do in my current day to day and how I got here and how that could potentially um, provide some insight for potential students who are seeking grant related opportunities or possibly already have some experience with grants or working with nonprofits and might want to build on those skills. So uh, my approach to English and communications at Our Lady of the Lake University, I genuinely believe that they do quantify and qualify my experience. So again, I want to thank Our Lady of the Lake for having me as the final guest presenter today. Um, also, I would like to thank Dr. Sanborn for having reached out to me and giving me an excuse to dive back into my graduate technical communication materials which I do keep on hand in file um, because it, it does continue to help me uh, in not just with my job application materials, but also in my current job. And so very similar to an inclusion statement, uh, it is very important to have an, a career objective. Many of you who are already working on your job application materials might already know this. For those of you who are just starting to explore um, that realm, very important to have a career objective. This is normally a statement that, you know, is at the very top of your resume. But again, I think it's important to already generate a career objective for yourself so that you have a better understanding of what you as an individual are looking for. And so technical communication tells us, sorry, technical communication in the 21st century, which is actually a text that I used when taking a technical communication course at Our Lady of the Lake, um, tells us that we must develop a career objective or purpose when applying for jobs. So this is, it's very crucial. Um, but like writing a grant application, uh, the grant writer does in fact state an objective in terms that are brief and quantifiable. So when, for example, in my current job, when the federal government announces a funding opportunity, also known as a funding opportunity announcement, um, it is really important to first and foremost look at what the purpose is. So again, very similar to setting up my own career objective, or any one of us to set up our own career objective, very similar, a grant writer is already doing that in, in, in practice. And so the grant writer states outcomes that are realistic and, and so that does tie back to our career objective where again objectives should be kept short and realistic um, again it does inform readers about your goals during the next five to ten years maybe you don't explicitly quantify them but again if you can in a way convey outcomes that again are realistic in other words can be achieved and measured um, then you are going to set yourself up in a very a very good position to, again, like writing a grant application, you are justifying your need for services and in your own career pursuits, you are justifying an organization's need for an expert like yourself. So as a technical communicator, again, it is important to know and understand uh, the target audience or community you propose to serve. 
So, uh, and I'll get into that a little bit further into the presentation. Um, but first and foremost, we must write and design with a target audience in mind. So what I do wanna dive into next is um, more my relationship with Our Lady of the Lake University and why being here is, um, is just very important to me. In my first two years at the lake, um, as you can see here, I, I did take a, a variety of courses that ranged from literary journalism to television and film studies courses. And uh, so even though those courses were not very specific to grant writing, the practice and cra learning of a craft uh, definitely provided structure in what I was going to face later in my Art Lady of the Lake career. So in taking advantage of the courses that were more relevant to me, but also just of interest to me, I took a number of film studies courses with Professor Winstead uh, because not only did I wanna learn a new craft, for example, learning to write a short screenplay, um, but I also gener genuinely and generally had an interest in film. And so again, just exploring the types of skill set, but also the different types of crafts that I could take advantage of. And so in year two of my graduate program, I was actually offered more opportunities, which I was eager to take advantage of. I, I worked with, under, under Dr. Mary Francine Danis in the University Writing Center. And so for a full calendar year, I was one of the professional writing consultants in the writing center. And so I worked with a number of disciplines from social services to business to science. And so I also exposed myself to disciplines beyond my own, which was English. And, and not only that, the university center at the time was housed in the Warden School building. And so we did see a number of social service, social work students um, who brought in a number of reports for proofreading and for any sort of writing assistance. And in a way that actually enhanced my own personal ability to provide feedback and give instruction and, uh, and just overall enhanced my own reporting skills. Uh, one good thing to know actually about grants is whenever you do secure a grant award, there are program reporting and financial reporting requirements. And so any sort of opportunity to enhance reporting skills, I would advise students to take advantage because, um, and, and whether it's in a grant space or not, I, I do believe that you will face some sort of progress reporting in any sort of organization that you work for. So I think that is just a good skill to have. Um, also, I was given an opportunity by Dr. Leah Larson to participate in a grant writing practicum. And so I participated with two other graduate students and practiced as a grant writer under the sponsored programs officer in the Office of Academic Affairs. And so I was really grateful for this opportunity because not only were we reviewing grant opportunities, but we were actually making legitimate requests for funding. So I teamed up with our director of health services at the time at Our Lady of the Lake and drafted an abstract for funding. Um, I, we submitted the abstract for funding, but the director of health services was not was looking for funding for a conference, but there weren't any viable opportunities at the time. But we did start looking at opportunities outside of the country. So um, there were some some logistics to work through. But again, just putting the putting in the time to practice and start working with proposals, I found that to be uh, to be very rewarding. And so, and then ultimately, uh, in my final year at Our Lady of the Lake. In year three, that is when I met Dr. Sanborn and took my first technical communication course. And in that course, obviously, I, I 
I absorbed as much as I, I could uh, as far as building on skills. But one specific skill that Dr. Sanborn called out for me was the grant writing skill and how that that was going to be such a powerful skill going forward and how it was so needed. At the time, while I was going full time to Our Lady of the Lake, I was also starting a new job working full time as a grants administrator for a small family foundation in San Antonio. And um, and so almost in real time, as I started working in a grants profession, was building on these skills in my technical communication courses. And so um, it was a lot of back and forth from real world practice to the classroom, but it was so it just was so valuable. I can't say that enough. And so that flash forward leads me to where I, I feel I am now um, a technical communications advocate um, and professional. And so uh, I, I believe that that's what led me to professional development opportunities also as an alumna. Um, more recently, um, I, well, actually this was in 2016, uh, Dr. Sanborn called on me to uh, be a guest presenter for the Our Lady of the Lake Technical Writing and Grant Writing Lab Open House. And, and for this, I, I was highlighting a grant writing course that was being offered at the time, uh, but also this is where I first got my start in speaking to the value of grant writers in the capitalist economy and how a number of, of disciplines, again, from humanities to, to STEM and how it is very necessary that they have the expert grant professionals to, to sustain, to secure and sustain this type of funding. And then ultimately now uh, with the the 2021 Mass Communications Conference. Uh, again, I'm, I'm honored to be here, but I definitely think that opportunities, professional opportunities like this will come to, to you students beyond just the classroom. So here we have a quote from um, actually an Our Lady of the Lake University alum. Um, she, Marby Shaw, graduated from Our Lady of the Lake in 2019 with a Master of Science in Organizational Leadership. Um, she currently works as the Assistant Director of Regional Youth and Teen Services for Good Samaritan Community Services, which is a local and uh, statewide nonprofit. And, and, and Marby just shares that grant writers are extremely valuable. The biggest disconnect that she sees is a, not just a lack of understanding. I should rephrase that. So understanding the programs and the people you serve are crucial, but Marby has been a witness to individuals understanding the programs, but not quite understanding the populations. So I will get into that a little further in the presentation, um, just about reaching our target audiences. But I thought this was good perspective from, from somebody who works on the programmatic side of a nonprofit organization that does rely heavily on grant funding to survive. Okay, so I apologize. My dog is going crazy. So uh, again, in a way, I feel that I have a responsibility to be here as a technical communication professional. Um, uh, as technical communicators, we must write and design with a target audience in mind. I, I believe I mentioned that earlier in the presentation. Uh, we stress the importance of not only targeting audiences, but targeting different audiences across different mediums. So I think that that is, you know, the reason why we are here as part of the Mass Communications Conference. You know, we are being exposed to different mediums in the technical communication world. And Professor Eigen mentioned something earlier in the conference about, about the student the student population that is attending this conference, that they do have a vast and unique set of skills and are looking for ways that they can apply it to the real world, but also in vast and unique ways. And so with a mass communication conference of this stature, I think OLU does create such a space 
to explore diverse audiences and expose students to general topics in communications that do serve as models for writers. As I mentioned earlier, uh, just as an example, I, I served in the University Writing Center for about a year. And during that time, I, again, enhanced my personal ability to, to provide feedback, but also, again, to instruct and help in the effort to improve student writing skills. Very similar uh, with the grant writing practicum. I believe that hands-on exercises like working on actual grant proposals are valuable training. And even though that grant writing practicum was six hours of credit and not necessarily a paid internship or job experience, it was experience. And it's experience and training with grants like that that do lead eventually to internships and jobs. So really it's, again, it's, it's knowing what you are interested in and which opportunities you are willing to take advantage of to take your student career to the next level. I think it's also important to have an open dialogue with your professors. Um, just as much as you have to define who your audience is, you are their audience and they will do their best to meet your needs. Okay, so this next slide um, really, it, it doesn't showcase in a chronological order, but it does showcase the areas of different grant or development and fundraising or just general nonprofit work that, uh, that I have done throughout the last uh, 10 years. And, and as you can see over on the left-hand side, this is more the weighted professional career in the more recent years. As I mentioned, I'm currently the grants manager for the Office of Behavioral Health. Um, this isn't the first state agency that I worked for. I moved to Colorado six years ago, and within four months, taking the communication, technical communication skills that I inherited at Our Lady of the Lake, as well as the education I had received, I, I felt confident that I was going to be able to achieve a career in grant. So I did take a little bit of a leap of faith here. I did relocate without having a, a job or career lined up. But again, I, as a technical communicator and a, a researcher and knowing exactly what technical steps I was going to have to take, I, I was prepared. I was prepared for the job hunt. And so, as I mentioned, within four months, I secured a role as a grants administrator uh, for the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, and that is actually the single state Medicaid agency. So I did work for the Colorado Medicaid population, and that was. Ex an extremely um, rewarding experience. Uh, having grown up, so I'm originally from San Antonio, I should have mentioned this earlier, and I grew up in the Rio Grande Valley, and growing up in and among a low-income population, I felt like securing grant funds to support Medicaid programs and projects, um, it just, again, I, I felt like there was such a strong connection there and it was the right fit, the right position, the right audience for me to move into my next uh, grants professional role. And, uh, and then I also did receive experience in a number of institutional offices. So uh, National Jewish Health is home, sorry, Denver is home to National Jewish Health, which is the number one respiratory hospital in the country for the last 20 years. And National Jewish Health, being a nonprofit, has a very well-established development office. I was lucky enough to receive the position as the capital campaign coordinator. Uh, National Jewish 
Jewish health was already in its a final two years of its capital campaign. I had never worked on a capital campaign before. I had worked in a development office before, but never on a project of such magnitude and a project that had already been ongoing for about eight years before I started. That's how long um, the strategic plan, as well as cultivating a number of donors to support such a large capital campaign. And so I was grateful to be part of that experience. And then again, very, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my experience in the Office of Academic Affairs, even though that was not paid work or an internship, I did treat the practicum as valuable experience. And so I do list it, again, depending on the job that I might be applying for, I will either list it as part of my professional experience or as what I define as an organization appointed volunteer activity. And so, uh, so yeah, so again, I'm grateful for that experience. And then not to really go into every single bullet, but you'll notice on the right hand side, my foundation experience as well as working for educational services programs was very early on uh, prior, again, prior to me moving to Colorado, but uh, I, the experience does not go overlooked. Um, these opportunities helped me in my transition from a journalism program to a, an English program that was going to help me in the nonprofit realm. And so now as a grants professional, I, you know, I, I do, uh, I do think that my, my journalism experience does continue to also help me on the day-to-day. -day. Um, but again, I think that is a fraction of the technical communication um, experience, the technical communication lens. Sorry, I do apologize. I'm working off of my state computer today. And so uh, occasionally that message does pop up. Okay. so. This is actually a slide from my technical communication materials from when I was a student. Um, I, I did graduate seven years ago and, and do constantly look to, um, to resources like the Society for Technical Communication and do, uh, do try to see what, what are the latest practices in technical communicating. But simply put here, the process for preparing job application materials I, I do follow these seven steps every time I apply for a job. I do want to share a story about um, when I graduated from St. Mary's, I, I accepted a one-year internship with City Year San Antonio, which is a local nonprofit that serves students in, this, in a school setting. And and I know it, it's a little, I guess, unorthodox. You typically think of an internship, you know, while you're still in school, you know, once you have your degree, most folks are ready to just, I want a paid job. But I'm actually very glad that I took that one year internship um, because it actually led me to my first job as a grants professional working for the Harvey E. Najem Family Foundation of San Antonio. And it, it's interesting, you know, I, I followed these steps very closely um, in a way, you know, uh, at the time I, I hadn't taken a technical communication course yet, but at St. Mary's had been a, a frequent <laughs> customer of the career services office. And so, uh, so uh, you know, got an early start on, um, on what my own personal job application process would look like. But um, I was grateful to the opportunity that I had in my internship. I assisted the executive director with his board of directors communication, but more valuable than that, I, I assisted the external relations team with really anything that they needed help with. <laughs> uh, you know, I was an intern, but uh, I, I was exposed to their development work including their newly hired grant writer. 
I was immediately in awe of her and in a way envious because I saw the value of her role and how crucial it was to city or San Antonio, you know, sustaining their funding and their program and programs. And so again, grateful to the one year opportunity because I don't know had I not taken advantage of that, I don't know if I I would have seen something like that in real time. I might have, you know, just been so convinced that I was going to look for journalism careers. I had no idea that I was going to go down this career path of grants. And and when I interviewed for the Najem Family Foundation, actually what it came down to was a reference from City Year San Antonio. City Year San Antonio, one of their funders is the Najem Family Foundation. And the foundation could see that if I could support an organization like City Year, as well as the populations that they serve, then I could do the same for several other organizations. So the Najem Family Foundation is a grant making organization and I worked for them for nearly two years learning and understanding what each nonprofit that they supported in the greater San Antonio area, uh, what they did, but also uh, again, how important it was gonna be to sustain their funding going forward. And so the Najem Family Foundation would have quarterly board meetings and, and here I could put document creation and technical writing into practice. Um, with each application that the Najem Family Foundation received, I was able to review, consolidate, and then in turn create board portfolios for each board director, listing out each organization and highlighting the, the meat of their grant applications. And so again, that was not knowing at the time what document creation and design was, or at least from a technical communicator lens, I, I think, you know, I, I got such great exposure and was able to put, uh, again, put together just a very clean and technical document. And so, uh, again, something that I, I just thought I went from one internship to my first entry level job. And again, before you know it, these were things that I was putting in my actual portfolio. And, uh, and so, yes, again, grateful for those opportunities. Um, now, as a grants professional, I, I, um, so I, ma I manage grants, but specifically, I oversee two community block grants and more than five discretionary grants, and because of the timing, two emergency COVID grants for our office. And so I work with a number of program staff and data and evaluation folks and fiscal and financing, um, you know, to help with grant budgets, the financial reporting. But as a technical communicator, I oversee all of the grantee documentation, but more importantly, the block grant document itself. The block grant document, it and again, the block grant, for those of you who do not know, is a large, well, first of all, it is mandated by Congress that the state of Colorado apply for this block grant because it does support our statewide services for substance abuse and mental health. Um, but more than that, we do seek feedback on the document itself from the public comment, sorry, from the the public so that they can, they can comment, um, but also from our internal and external stakeholders. So I, I am not a subject matter expert by no means. Um, I do not have a background in public policy. I do not have, I apologize. I do not have um, a behavioral health clinical experience, but again, as a technical communicator, I'm able to do the research and and put together, again, a very clean and technical document that our 
our stakeholders can respond to. Okay. So, um, Jennifer Simons Lindsay is a senior program officer at the Alamo Colleges Foundation. And and Lindsay, Jennifer Lindsay, I want to share this quote with you. I think it's a very powerful quote, um, and I, I want to make sure that I capture all of it. So Jennifer Simons Lindsay recently shared that after leaving the teaching profession, managing grants has been a way for me to continue to make an impact in my career. I have found the opportunity to ensure the students, teachers, and schools have the resources they need while enjoying a healthy work-life balance. Recently, my career in grants transitioned to higher ed, and I'm excited to contribute to ensuring access to quality higher education for all. So I appreciate Lindsay sharing that because, uh, again, as somebody who, who transitioned into a grants role, I think she had valuable perspective on, on what that what that would do going forward. And I think, again, for the way she phrased it, access to higher quality, higher education for all. Um, it, it's going to be so important. Education grants, um, that is you know, a realm that I have not worked directly in. Um, I have supported private grants for education programs, but I think working for a foundation of the Alamo College's stature is, is, is so beneficial. And so I want to share a number of grant related career paths that individuals might be interested or taking advantage of if, if again, grant writing specifically is not something that they are interested in, uh, in pursuing. So on the left hand side here, uh, grant technical writer is, is what I consider myself, but I am also a grants manager uh, by by trade, um, which means that I actually work with program staff who are the subject matter experts who I assist in the writing and proofing and overall submission of grants. But also within that, uh, there is a finance component to our grants as well. Our budget analysts and accountant and I work hand in hand to make sure that grant budgets are, are tight and have no room for error. <laughs> really, there are just there is a surmountable list of allowable activities that the federal government will allow, uh, but there are also activities that they will disallow. And so it is really important that I work with but our grants budget analysts to understand what the federal regulations are, understand what we have in statute. Um, and again, I I don't know everything, you know, like the back of my hand, and I don't expect anybody else to. So this is an area where as a grants professional, you can lean on other experts within your office um, to support you. And that, that goes for data and evaluation as well, as well as project and program managing. And then there are other areas that, again, industry specific grants. So as I mentioned, I work in the public health sector and, and did so when working for Colorado Medicaid as well. And, you know, again, education, health, human services, public affairs, art initiatives, um, environmental projects. Uh, I will say this uh, if anyone is curious. That uh, so I have worked for the Colorado Department of Human Services for nearly two years. Um, I don't have any immediate plans of leaving, but I have started to think about you know what my next move might be if I were to leave. Um, you know what industry or realm would I like to see myself working in? And right now, environment and climate justice is definitely a space that I would like to move into, whether it's on the grant side or even as a communications professional. Um, I think climate resilient communities are information seeking communities. And if you can take the information, disseminate it, 
um, and in a way that your audience understands, I think that it, you know, is a strong skill to bring to that industry. And there is uh, one last comment that I would just also like to make as far as audiences go. I, I made a little note here so I didn't forget. But um, as technical communicators, we think about you know, our audiences in very specific and particular ways. Um, I myself don't know the Colorado uh, population, again, like the back of my hand. I would love to, um, but I do know that we have priority populations within within the state and so i think it is important that as you continue forward as a technical and a grant professional that you do find ways to continue to build your knowledge base but also again have a strong understanding of populations even if it's just a general understanding to begin with you know um if you're interested in supporting pregnant and parenting women i you know there is definitely a niche and all sorts of programs not just throughout the state, but also, you know, in a local and community level and different areas where folks can get involved. Um, a, a number of these nonprofit organizations just rely heavily on grant funding to, to exist and to con continue to grow and expand. Um, and, you know, with operations, a number of staff are paid from grants. And so if, if an organization wanted to, um, again, to grow, they would have to rely on grants that are specific to supporting staff because you also don't want to take away funding from direct services that would go to an individual or supporting an individual. Um, so again, there are grants out there that will specifically help you with uh, or those organizations with infrastructure. And so uh, again, grant writers, grants administrators, grants managers, um, it's, you know, however you want to tailor it, you know, those types of roles are needed for their expertise in just securing the funds alone. Um, it is, yeah, and, and one challenge as a communicator of technical documents can be writing and designing for individuals we never even directly see or speak to. Um, working for the state, my grants manager role is very behind the scenes. Um, when I worked for Colorado Medicaid, it was slightly different, but, um, you know, uh, we as the state, we, we will typically apply for a grant and become the primary recipient of that grant. But then we, in turn, put those grant funds into contracts, and the contracts that we have are with service providers um, or service organizations, and then they in turn contract out with community organizations and local nonprofits and other, uh, other organizations who rely on the grant funding to execute those services in the community. So I don't, again, I'm not in, in a clinic. I'm, I'm not forward facing with any of our, um, of our individuals, especially, you know, working in health, uh, HIPAA is, is very important, um, but it, it, it makes it more difficult However, I think, you know, through research and practice, you know, we as technical communicators better understand digital documents to better understand and address our audience. So that's just one, one thing that I wanted to make sure to share is, again, I, you know, you might not be extroverted and want to even associate directly with any sort of clientele. And so maybe grants might be the role for you. Or maybe you do want to be in a grants policy role, but you want to be interacting with stakeholders in the community. So again, there are just there are different opportunities. And a final note before I hand it over to Professor Adegin, I just want to say that these working for state government has been extremely beneficial. Um, the, literally, the benefits are great, but working in this space has um, has opened me up to other opportunities within the state and what other experts are out there. And so I, I very much encourage students to look at their state job boards, to look at foundation boards, see what organizations some of these foundations are supporting. But uh, again, 
state job boards are going to provide just a wealth of opportunities out there. Um, again, I'm not interested in leaving anytime soon, but I actively look at the Colorado State Job Board to just, again, know what jobs are being marketed, what technical communication professionals out there, and it just gives me a better understanding of the grants landscape. So thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm ready for questions. Uh, Professor Edigain, I will go ahead and hand it to you. Awesome. Thanks, Steph. That was uh, super intriguing. I really love uh, the insight. So I'm going to pass it off to Kat. Kat is uh, monitoring our face. I mean, I'm sorry, our Instagram. And there's questions on there, I believe. So, um, so Kat, can you go ahead and see what questions they can ask? And then I know we got one from Stephanie Garcia as well. So I'll let Kat monitor that. Oh, moderate that. Sorry. So we're going to go to Stephanie's. Uh, she asked, do you think that social work students should take advantage of grant writing courses at OLU? Yes, I'm just reading the rest of the comment here. There's... Stephanie, that's a great question. I, a short answer, yes. I do believe that they should take advantage of any sort of grant writing courses. Um, but also, again, uh, I mentioned earlier in the presentation, definitely talk to your professors as well as, um, you know, the heads of your department, because there may be opportunities that could be formulated, uh, but also they could be on the lookout for you. Um, I do think it would be advantageous for a social work or social service student to be in a grant role because i mean right there you come with a wealth of experience in again in practice from a social work lens and a number of these grant funds do support social programs and so i think being an advocate in the role is going to again it, it's going to be a driver in how eager you are to secure these funds. Um, some grant applications are non-competitive, but most are competitive. And even when they aren't competitive, you still wanna give your best effort. And I think that is where technical communication skills would also play, um, again, a great role in managing your, your job materials. And so Stephanie, I would also advise you to look into ways that you can also build on your technical communication skills in addition to your social work. Great, thank you. And then there's a question from Marissa. She says, I'm currently studying tech studying tech communications, I'm guessing, at Our Lady of the Lake University. But the jump from school to a career in tech communications seems especially large for me. Those who only experience, sorry, is my Olu education. What advice do you have for people finally looking to take the big step from school to a career in technical communication? So I will agree that it is it is a big step. Uh, as I mentioned, I took a leap of faith having minimal experience. I had a two year full time job under my belt. Yes, it was a grants professional role, um, but it, it was still an administrator role. So um, a very entry level and, and, and in a way I was, I was naive also. Um, I really wasn't sure what I was looking for at the time, as I mentioned during the presentation, that I was going to school full-time at Our Lady of the Lake, but also working full-time at the foundation. And so I, I was really, like, trying to take, take things hand in hand. I was trying to go back to the classroom with work, minimal work experience, but also take what I was learning in the classroom to enhance my professional experience as it was happening. And so um, I, I will also say that, again, there, there's not really a grant major, just as with our, the graduate program, uh, which may have already expanded, but at the time there was not a technical communication track or major. It was more a handful of courses that I was trying to take advantage 
of before I graduated. Again, this was in my final year. So I, I guess some additional advice that I would give is, is what I had stated at the end of the presentation. I would look at a job board, uh, specifically the state job board, and I would see, again, what minimum qualifications state agencies are looking for that could give you some idea of what skill you would need to build on, specifically as a technical communicator, that could help you drive your interest. Speaking of opportunities and um, you know job searching, can you use some technical writing techniques for scholarships? If so, how can I apply them? Uh, just to make sure I understand, so like applying for competitive scholarships? Yes, I believe that's what they're asking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I would first, again, begin by determining what the, uh, the objective is, um, what specific purpose the grant scholarship, sorry, the scholarship um, is expecting. So uh, there would be expectations and requirements with any sort of exchange of money, um, but also justifying your skills. And I, I think I had seen another question in the chat that somewhat applied, you know, someone had asked, what tips do you have for learning to be competitive while in the grant like writing field? So I think those go a little hand in hand. Um, so to enhance the competitive, uh, you know, side of you, I guess you could say, I, it, it really comes down to what is black and white. Yes, I, I, I consider myself also a, a creative writer, but that is something that I also have to separate when, when being more of a technical communicator. Um, again, there, there goes, there's a lot of research that will go into knowing what your audience is. And so the best advice that I can give is to just learn the organization in and out. And as you are going through that, those steps in that research, just start pulling qualities, phrases, anything that stands out that you can use to justify yourself as the recipient of that scholarship, the recipient of that grant. Thank you for your advice. And we have another question on Instagram from Sophia. She says, how do you keep up with changing donor environment slash grant program trends? Sorry, Kat, can you repeat the question one more time? Yes. So Sophia asks, how do you keep up with changing donor environment slash grant program trends? That is a good question. Um, so the grants that we receive for the state um, and just grants in general will usually have a funding official tied to it, whether it is a grant program official or a grant management specialist. So even though I am the grants manager, a funder will still have a grants man management specialist assigned to the award for those budget specific questions and funding specific questions, whereas the program official is there to answer more the programmatic and data specific questions. And so a good way to keep up with the trends is to keep an open dialogue with your funders. Um, I think if, if you are looking for new grant opportunities and, you know, and just wanting to peruse I would call up uh, an officer from a foundation. Uh, they take calls frequently, um, just explaining more whether it's their mission, what opportunities they're specifically looking to fund, um, what trends they're seeing. And so really, again, it's, it's about having that open dialogue, but defining what your network is in your current role. So if you are currently trying to figure out, okay, what grants are available, there, 
at grants.gov. Remember that website, you can search a variety of government grants, but also the government provides a number of links to more local opportunities and as well as creates a blog space where folks can uh, monitor community trends and and really again get an understanding of what topics folks are talking about in the grant world what topics folks are talking about in the funding world so uh, i do think that yes that there are a, a number of areas um where where you can start this conversation and you know, if there are any grant writing course workshops, lots of times the facilitators were, will also want to share, you know, what the trends are in funding. So again, it's it's more about um, asking other folks in a grant role, asking folks who are in a funding role, in a foundation role, in a state role. There are a number of areas where uh, you can start the conversation. We have another question from Instagram asking, is there a difference between a profit and a nonprofit grant writer? Um, I haven't had too much experience with for profit. Uh, the majority of grant writers are going to be nonprofit or public entities. Um, but I, I will say this. Uh, so when looking at grant opportunities, usually in the early part of the opportunity announcement, usually within the, the first page or on the company who is funding it, uh, their website, there will usually be eligibility requirements as well as definitions on who and how they are eligible. So uh, for example, within the state of Colorado, we receive opportunities all the time from you know, community organizations who are more interested in us as the state agency applying versus the, the smaller organization. And sometimes I'll look at the eligibility requirements and see that, yes, the state can fit into you know, the nonprofit and public space, but the it might be more advantageous for a community to apply directly. So I only use that as an example, just to say that, uh, that there are eligibility requirements and I would review those, but unfortunately I do not have a, a lot of experience in for-profit space to speak to that. Thank you, and we only have time for one more question. The question being, what are the common challenges you face in grant writing? The most common challenge, and and I believe uh, I, I touched on this at the very end of the presentation, is that since I am not a subject matter expert in healthcare, again, not having a clinical background, um, but all similar to project and program management, I have picked up a variety of project management skills and even began studying for a certification in associate project management when I worked for the state the first time um, in order to help me manage grants. But when it comes to actually writing the grant, I think the most difficult part is um, when you when you don't have that that education or background. And it requires you as a technical and a grant professional to do your homework, do your research, but pull in those subject matter experts to assist you on the grant. Um, you know, uh, I do get asked quite often if I feel, if even though I'm a grant manager, do I even consider myself a grant writer? Or do I feel like I'm a writer? And, and to that I say yes. Uh, because even when writing the, the framework of a grant or drafting the framework of a grant, 
I'm, I have the, the internal stakeholders that I work with at my beck and call. I want to work with the data and evaluation manager first and foremost, because the data is extremely important. Uh, you know, earlier I mentioned that just finding ways to justify yourself or your organization, whether it's a scholarship application or a grant application, the data is going to be the most technical piece of your proposal. It's black and white. There is really no way to, to fluff that. Um, and I tend to, again, to stay away from the fluff um, because I want to make sure that my justification is clear and concise and speaks to the population itself. Cool, wow, that was a interesting presentation, Steph. Thank you so much. I can't believe uh, that went by super fast. Wow, crazy. Um, thank you for your insight. Um, I was wondering if you can maybe share with um, the students here, uh, maybe uh, like some networking opportunities for you. Uh, I know they have further questions, maybe an email or uh, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever it might be. If you can just sh share it on the chat, if you don't mind. No, not at all. Um, in fact, yes, I am happy to receive any additional questions beyond this presentation. Um, and then of course, uh, I would hope that the next uh, mass communications conference has another grants component. And I would love to work with our Lay of the Lake students and faculty on ways that we can expand this to be more beneficial and targeted to students. Yeah, with that, I'm glad you said that. We uh, we're excited to announce that, yeah, next year we will have a conference. Hopefully it's face to face. We hope that it can um, allow to you know to bring speakers like yourself to kind of really uh, meet the students be more hands-on potentially even do like activities uh but we're really grateful for uh your your wisdom and your words and uh just for the, the students out there um here's the form again i know you got to fill that out for some of your classes but go ahead and fill that out um i guess that officially officially concludes um and then stephanie did her put her information on the chat but that officially concludes the mass conference Thank you so much, guys. Uh, keep an eye out for an email from uh, myself or Kat. Uh, we do want to get final feedback on you guys. And um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you guys love the speakers. I hope it was informative. We look forward to seeing y'all again next year. Good luck on your finals. And if I don't see some of y'all, have a great, great rest of your summer. And God bless. And instead, if you don't mind sticking around for a second. Sure. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Professor Winstead. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, doing well. I actually just came across my short screenplay the other day and reread it and thought of you. And and so that's why I had to mention it on the presentation because it just was it was just such a nice moment. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can understand everything that I'm following through in this screenplay. <laughs> I'm so glad. And it's just so good to see you. And congratulations on all your success. I'm so proud of you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I'm going to let you go and talk to AJ.